this episode, we are delving into the mysteries of fire, of light, and of shadow. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode, and today we're putting the finishing touches on our cave environment, at least the visual part of it. And I know we've already done a ton with fire over the course of this series, but fire's pretty elemental, so we're gonna master it. We haven't yet done any sort of environmental fire in the game that we're making, so this is the first. And my goal with everything that we set up this episode is that you're going to have the various components for fire that you'll need for any fire actor. So you'll have, obviously, the Niagara system, but also the light component, and also a pretty good meta sound to use. And then we can use those various components in any kind of fire actor that we have throughout our game. So here are the key concepts for today, and there are a few new things in this episode, but really it's about bringing together all these different facets, all these different areas that we've covered over the course of this series into one cohesive, optimized actor blueprint. And along with the old during the course of this episode, there's a lot of little hacks and tips and tricks, so I hope you enjoy it. And lastly, here are the free assets from Quixel Bridge that you'll need to follow along this episode. And as of recording this on 5.1, it's important that we don't use Nanite on these assets, and I'll explain why over the course of the episode. This might change in the future, but really, it's not going to matter to get the really nice torchlight effect that we're going for. So let's get to it. All right, so to start this episode, we're once again going to convert our starter content fire over to a Niagara system. And I know I keep using the starter content fire, but I really like it. I've looked at other fire assets out there, and at least for free content, it's the best thing out there. And that makes sense because it's Unreal Engine's standard starter content. So we're going to start by going to Content Drawer in a Niagara Environmental Effects. I'm going to create a brand new folder for fire. And then I'll navigate back over to content, into starter content, into our particles, and we'll right click on P fire and say convert to Niagara system. If you don't have this option, just a reminder, we've done this in a lot of previous episodes, but if you search for cascade to Niagara system converter, cascade to Niagara converter, you'll need to check that and restart the engine if you don't already have it. And then you'll be able to right click on this if you have starter content enabled and then convert to Niagara system. It'll take a few seconds here and then right click, rename. We're going to name it torchfire underscore NS. And then what I'll do is I'll expand under Niagara environmental effects and we'll move it into our fire folder. Move here. So we'll go into that folder. We'll open up that system. So there's a couple of emitters here that we're not going to need. So the first thing is I'll pause the system. We can disable the flames 001 emitter and also our sparks emitter. We won't need that. So I'm going to select both of these emitters, move them over, consolidate these down to the four. And the first thing I'm going to do, I know we've done this a ton of times before, guys. I apologize. We are going to acknowledge and clear all the issues. And also down here under Niagara Log, acknowledge and clear these. And then we see under the embers emitter, we have this GPU emitter properties. The emitter is GPU and is using dynamic balance mode. So we have to update this to be fixed. And I'm also going to switch the other emitters over to GPU because since these are just torch lights, we're not going to have collision. We don't need to use CPU and that's going to make our performance a lot better. So sim target GPU compute sim and make sure this is set to fixed and do that for the other emitters as well. And we'll see that for the flames emitter, when we switch that over to a GPU, then we can't do our light renderer. And that's okay, because if we're rendering lights for each particle, that's pretty performance intensive. So we're gonna take care of the lighting in the second half of this episode, but let's delete this out for now. So in our flames emitter, now we can update the things we need to. So under spawn rate, we're gonna up this to seven. In initialize particle, we're changing our lifetime a little bit, giving it a little bit more variance, 0.5 to 1.0. For the shape location, we want all this fire to spawn basically at the same point right around our torch wherever that's going to be so the sphere radius is just going to be one not 30 centimeters so we don't need two add velocity nodes i'm going to disable the second one this add velocity 001 i'm just going to switch this so instead of the fire going off sideways with the x's we're going to make those zero and the z that's our upward velocity i'm going to change that make it a little bit higher 8 to 13. and now if i zoom in a little bit we see our fire is basically straight up i can hit play and there it goes we can disable both of these dynamic material parameters. We won't need those. And also we can disable the cascade conversion light properties. Now the main problem that I see with the emitter is that it starts the fire very, very small. And realistically, it's not gonna start that small. It's not gonna look realistic if it starts at zero. So under scale sprite size here, we have to change this to, I'm gonna move it up to 0.25. And this is our normalized time. This is the lifetime of the particle. So at 0.25 time, I'm gonna add a key. So right here, it's at 0.1. So at 10% of its lifetime, we're going to change that value to be 0.275. So it starts off getting larger at a very slow rate. And then instead of ramping up all the way to one, we are going to make this only 0.6. So it's not going to grow that large because we're talking about just a torch light effect. The fire is pretty small. For the acceleration force down here, I want to change this a little bit. So I want to give it a random range vector. So we can hit the arrow, search for random range vector. 
and then the x, I'm going to make this vary between negative 5 and 5. That's going to vary it to the left and right just a little bit. And for the z, I'll keep this 0 and 1. So it's just a very slight acceleration. But then when we play, we're getting a little bit more variation to the sides. I'm going to do one more thing to give it variation. And that is under particle update, we are going to add some curl noise. And I played with these curl noise settings a little bit. I don't really understand the difference between these. Obviously, strength is the intensity of the curl. But I got the best effect with the noise strength of about 10 and the noise frequency of 200. And I also switched this noise quality cost to baked low here, just so that this is really performant. The very last thing I did under particle update, I added a point attraction force, point attraction. And the idea of this is that the fire is being pulled upward. And so I want that point to be slightly above the flame. So the attraction strength is going to be 10, attraction radius is 100. And I'm going to check this attractor position offset. And to get it slightly above the flame, we're going to give it a Z of 10, so 10 centimeters above the origin. All right, so now on to the smoke emitter. For this one, we're going to give it a spawn rate instead of 2, 10. Under add velocity, I'm going to change this up quite a bit. So instead of X being 35 to 60, we're going to make that 0 and 0. And upwards, it's just going to be 2 to 5. So basically percolating straight up. Now the interesting thing we're doing with the smoke is under scale sprite size here. We are going to start it at 0, but we're going to add a key at 0 0.5. Add key. And at 0 0.5, it's going to be a value of 0 0.4, slightly less than it is. But up here, instead of continuing to grow, we're going to select the key at 1, 1. We're going to change this to actually get smaller with time. This is going to be 0 0.225. And then also to give the smoke quite a bit of randomization, under this uniform curve scale here, instead of being a uniform scale, I'm going to do a random range, random range float. And that's going to be from 1 to 3. And all of a sudden, our smoke just got a lot bigger, a lot more interesting. But you see our smoke is still kind of drifting off there to the left. So under acceleration force, we got to get rid of that x. And instead, actually, we're going to do a random range vector. It's going to be a minimum of negative 10x, maximum of 10x. And same with the y. We're going to do negative 10 and 10. And with the z, it is going to drift upward. It's going to accelerate with time. So 30 to 40. So some variation in the acceleration. So the smoke is mostly going upward, but it is going off a little bit to the side. Some randomization. So then on to the embers emitter. This one, we're going to give a spawn rate instead of 30, just 5. Under initialized particle, lifetime, we're going to keep that 1.2 to 1.6. But the big thing, or I should say the little thing, is sprite size. We're going to make this a lot smaller. So this is going to be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and a maximum of 1.0 to 1.0. So very small embers. Shape location, again, we're going to make that sphere radius of 1. We're going to disable both of these add velocity nodes. For acceleration force here, we're going to up this Z to 300. So those embers are going to percolate up pretty quick. So now if we play here, and you might need to zoom in to really see them, but you see the embers, they're kind of zipping out pretty far out from the fire. What's causing them to zoom out so far is this cascade conversion orbit here. And it's specifically this offset right here. So to bring them in a little bit more, we're going to make this smaller. So instead of negative 30, negative 20, instead of 30, 20. And that's going to bring them closer to the fire. So if you hit play, zoom in a little bit, yeah. They're still zooming out a little bit, but not much. Mostly just around the fire and then up. And actually, I think they're zooming up a little too fast. So acceleration force, I'll reduce this down to 200. Okay, on to the distortion emitter. This one's pretty straightforward. So a spawn rate, we're going to increase this to 10. In the shape location sphere, we're going to reduce this down not to 1, but just to 10. So right around the fire. Add velocity, instead of again being 35 and 60, it's just going to be 0, 0. And we're going to keep the Z 5 to 10, so the distortion is going to move up slightly. And then we're keeping everything else exactly the same. So acceleration 60, that's fine. Scale sprite size, just like that. All good. The last thing I'm going to do for all these emitters is I'm going to switch the emitter state over from self to system. And I don't think this is actually necessary, but I've heard it's just good practice to keep them all in the system, that it's more performant that way. So if your fire looks like this, if you got a little bit of smoke emanating mostly upward, but also outward, then you're ready. So now on to creating our torch actor. And for this, I'm going to use two free meshes that you can find in Quixel Bridge right here. Now, if you're following this series, you know exactly how this goes. So linked in the description below, you'll find a spreadsheet with codes that you can copy and paste directly into Quixel Bridge, and it'll take you directly to the asset that we're using. Now, for both of these assets, you don't need to download them at Nanite quality, and I'll explain why we can't use Nanite, at least as of 5.1. So for this, I found medium quality. It looks just fine. And then once you download and hit add, then you have to move them into a folder and I move them under a folder under mega scans 3d assets and actually this is where they land when you download them but I just put them under earth quadrant and then I also created a new folder for underground here and I just put them both here 
So now let's create a new torch blueprint. So back to content, back to blueprints under environmental. I'm gonna right click, create a new blueprint class. The parent class is gonna be actor and we're gonna name it torch fire one, one word. We'll go into that. So I'm gonna start by adding a component. It's gonna be a static mesh, static mesh component here. And I'll name this the torch stick. And for this one, the static mesh, this is where we can pick our palisade spike. And for this, I'm gonna rotate it upside down so that the pointy end is down. So that's gonna be wherever our torch is stuck. So 180 on the green axis. And then the scale, we gotta make this a lot smaller for the torch. So 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And when we place this blueprint into the level, we can actually adjust the scale, especially making that torch stick a lot longer if we need to. And then to that torch stick, we're gonna add another static mesh component. So static mesh, and this is going to be our torch top. And over here in static mesh, I'm just going to search for burnt firewood. And that's the other one we just downloaded. And that one, I'm going to change the location. So the Z is negative 72. And it's going to be a little bit too high. And that's okay, because we're going to change the scale here to 3 by 3 by 3. And that's going to bring it directly in line with the rest of the torch. But you see it's a little bit crooked, so I'm just going to change the rotation slightly. So E, and then I can tilt, tilt just like that. E and W on your keyboard are my two favorite keyboard shortcuts because it just goes from translation to rotation right back to translation. All right, so now as a child component of torch stick, not the torch top, but of torch stick, we are going to add a Niagara system, Niagara particle system component. And I'll just name this Niagara system. And this one is gonna be what we just created. So torch fire underscore NS. And there's our torch fire, but obviously we wanna put it in a position so we can just move it up, up, up. And I'm going to put it a little bit higher, so negative 70. And the reason this is negative is because we flipped our palisade stick around. So compile and save this, and we are ready to actually put our torch fire into the world. So content drawer, we can just drag it in, and you can adjust your camera just so you can zoom in very closely. And actually what I'm going to do, I'm going to delete it there. I'm going to put it exactly where you saw in the intro, which is on my sidewall shortly into the entrance of the cave, so right about there. And we can change the rotation a little bit, so E, move that over and out. So we got the start of our torch, but we have a few issues, right? So you would expect that the fire would be sorted, would be prioritized in front of this torch top here. And the other thing I'm noticing here is that there's no light emanating from the torch, aside from a very faint glow behind it. And if I go out a little bit this way, then I see the light way out into the distance, but that doesn't make a lot of sense. So we'll talk about the lighting, but let's first fix that culling. Let's first fix the sorting order of the fire and this mesh right here. So I tried all sorts of things to adjust this. I tried setting different things in the Niagara system. So in the system over here, I tried setting this to fixed bounds and I tried doing that for the emitter as well. I tried updating the fixed bounds to be much greater. That didn't have any effect. And I also tried all sorts of settings on the torch top here. So all sorts of visibility settings I tried playing with. None of them worked except for one setting that I thought was pretty cool. If you search for the word cull, there's this reverse culling here. And if you check that, what it looks like is that the mesh is only rendered on the opposite side of the mesh. Now this does have some issues because you see the stick here actually poking through that now. So we can also set reverse culling here on the torch stick as well. So I'm going to adjust the torch top to be a tiny bit smaller. So let's make it 2.5, 2.5, and 2.5. And that's looking pretty solid. So compile and save this. And then if we go back into our level, there we go. Now, if anyone has a better way of addressing this, I am all ears, so please post in the comments below. But I think this looks pretty good with the reverse culling. It basically switches the order in which things are culled, so the fire's in front. But now let's talk about the lighting issues. So there's really two issues. We got the radiating in the distance out there, even over on the walls over here, and then the fact that there's basically no light close to it. So let me talk about this problem first, and I still don't have a great solution to this either, but I'll show you what I did find out, and then we'll go from there. I think I got a pretty good solution to the local lighting. So to begin to understand the emissive lighting issue here, we gotta go back into the blueprint, and specifically, we need to go back into the Niagara system. And in the Niagara system, it's in the sprite renderer down here, specifically this material. But instead of going right into the material, let's make a duplicate of it so we can play around with it. So let's go into the folder. Just gonna right click, we're gonna duplicate, mfire sub uv1. I'm gonna rename that, and I'm just gonna call it sub uv without emissive lighting because I do have a way of turning off the emissive lighting, but it's not nearly as good looking as our fire is currently. So let's go into that. So with this duplicated, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to our torch fire NS and I'm just gonna switch it out right here. Sub UV without emissive lighting, save that. And then this way, what we can do is we can make this in a small window and we can actually watch our torch fire while we adjust this. I'm gonna expand out the details panel here. So I played with all sorts of these settings and I came up empty with every single one except for one. So what we're looking for is getting rid of this lighting effect on the edges of meshes in the distance. So we have to go down in the details panel under translucency and under advanced. 
and the only setting here that I found had an effect was under translucency pass and this after depth of field here. Instead of after depth of field, if I selected after motion blur and then applied that, when I do that, no more emissive lighting off of the sides and materials in the distance because it's not occurring until after motion blur is applied. But you'll notice your fire, it looks a lot worse than it did before. And in my mind, the trade-off isn't worth it. I really like the fire the way it was before. And actually, I think I like it even better with this before DOF checked. But I'm willing to live with it if you are, but I'm hoping that one of you out there knows a way of turning off that lighting in the distance when it's nowhere near our mesh here that we could apply some very basic settings somewhere in this emissive material and that would solve the issue so if you know how to solve that please post in the comments below the last thing i'm going to do here is i'm going to change the name of this so i'm going to say right click rename and instead of without emissive lighting we're going to say apply before dof but now let's talk about the other lighting problem, which I think we have a pretty good solution for, and that is the fact that there's no light around the fire here. But even before that, with lighting, we're always worried about performance. So let's turn on our show FPS, and let's see what our FPS, specifically our milliseconds, does before and after adding a light to this. So back in our blueprint, we can close out of our Torchfire NS. Won't need that. We can close out of our material here. So the first thing is, I'm going to add a point light, and I have a friend on the Discord. You know who you are, Clyde. And Clyde says, never ever use point lights. And I think he's right, but I think he's right in terms of rendering a scene because they're not real lighting. They're basically high performance lighting that's simplified. We're gonna call this the flame point light. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna contrast this with spotlights, which look really good, but performance is not so good. So for this flame point light, I'm gonna change the intensity here to 1000. I'm gonna change the light color to be a lot more flammable. So something like this, a bright orange, maybe even a red, right about there. I'm gonna give it a source radius. So that's the radius around the fire of about 10 centimeters. So 10, then I can move it up, move it up, be right around our fire. And then I'm also gonna give it a soft source radius of 50. So I'll compile and save that, and then let's look at our performance. So pretty good. So our frame rate went from in the 80s to just below 80. Not too bad. But the actual light is not doing well because we see this huge shadow right here. There's really no reason that the light should only be up there and not down here. But the problem is it's colliding with this mesh in this general vicinity. So how do we solve that? Well, we have to go to our torch top here and search for shadow just for the torch top. And for the torch top, I'm just going to say, because this is surrounded by fire, there is no reason for this top to generate a shadow. So I'm going to turn off cast shadow. And that's actually going to help with performance as well. So compile and save this and then let's Let's look at it. Yeah, so now we got a pretty good light all around, but we still have the shadow of the actual stick here. And for that, I'm also gonna do the same. So torch stick, I'll select that. And if you search for shadow up here, I'm just gonna make this smaller so we can look at it side by side. So we can again, uncheck cast shadow. And that looks pretty good because the fire is emanating around the overall area. And I don't think it'd be realistic to have a shadow in the vicinity here. So we can improve performance by not having a shadow on the stick and also make it look more realistic, I think. So compile and save this, minimize this. So we're back up to 80 some FPS, but let's contrast how this looks with a spotlight instead. So what I'm gonna do is back in our blueprint, I'm gonna add a spotlight and I'm gonna move the spotlight up to the same location. Now, the thing about the spotlight is it does shine in one particular direction. So what I recommend is we can make one spotlight that shines up and one that shines down. So I could rotate this 90 degrees, so that'll be the downward one. And what I could do for the color, I'll just select our flame point light here, select our light color, and we'll click and drag that over to the color picker. Okay, and then over to our spotlight, we'll select it right from our color picker, make sure we got the same exact kind of light. And I'll lower this intensity down to, let's do 1000. And I'll make it a little bit higher than the light so something like this maybe outer cone angle i'll make it to 90 degrees and maybe the intensity only like 500 for that one and then we could duplicate it right click duplicate and this one will flip over to negative 90 so it's pointed upward and i'll move it down move it below the fire and this one i'll raise the intensity to 1000 and so this is going to be much more performance intensive. So let's delete out our point light, let's compile and save this. Let's see how that looks. Yeah, and to really get the right effect, I wanted to zoom on it in play mode here. And you see the quality of the lighting. The lighting just feels more real, and especially if you add a flickering effect to it. But the problem is performance. So you see our frame right there, it jumped up a full millisecond. So you could go with spotlights. And in fact, if I was making cinematics with flame, I would stick only with spotlights and I would do the same exact stuff that we're going to do now with point lights. But I do intend in multiple scenes in our game to have multiple torches and I want them to be as performant as possible. So we're going to make the lighting as efficient as we can. And I think the point lights still look pretty good. And we're going to save about a millisecond to a millisecond and a half for each of the torches.
But now let's create the means by which our torch light is actually going to be able to flicker. And I've seen a lot of ways of doing this online, some with a timeline where the intensity goes up, it goes down, da 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 da. But we're going to do it in a material. And the reason for that is that anytime you could do something in a material, it's just much more performant. It's running entirely on the GPU. And the reason we can do that is because if I go back into my Torchfire blueprint and I expand this, so both on a spotlight but also a point light, there's the opportunity of putting on a material, a light function material here. And for our final torch, we're going to set this up on a point light, but I want you to see it on the spotlight first, see the flickering, and then we can switch it. So to create this material, I'm going to navigate back to our content drawer, back to content under mega scans, under surfaces. I'm going to create a new folder here for light function materials, light function materials. And we'll go into that and we'll right click, we'll create a brand new material and I'll call this the M underscore firelight. And we'll go into that. So the first thing we got to do for this is switch over our material domain to a light function. And this is really simple. All it is is an emissive color. So all we're going to do to start is get a texture sample, texture sample. And what I found to work well here is a noise note. So if I just search for noise and you could pick this one, that's good 64 by 64 tiling noise. I'm glad they named it good and not bad tiling noise. So we'll select that. That's a joke. So we've got to add the RGB here, add, and we're going to hook that up to the emissive color. And we can already see kind of a discoloring in certain parts of our noise here. But now the question is, how do we make the flickering actually random? And the way we're going to do that is with a time node. So time is exactly what it sounds like. It's passing in the time. And we're also going to use a scalar parameter. So scalar parameter, we're going to title this the flickering rate. And from time, we are going to divide this. So divide. And from the flickering rate, we're actually going to divide this by 1,000. So this is 1,000. And then hook this up here. But if I hook this up here to UVs, it's not going to cause flickering. What we're going to use to cause flickering is a sine node. And this is using math, which quite frankly is the furthest thing from my strong suit. But the way I understand sine is it's kind of an oscillating wave. Basically something gets weaker and then it gets stronger and it gets weaker and it gets stronger. And if you remember a couple of episodes back when we did the indoor Niagara 2D water, it worked off of a sine to move that ball across the water. And we can control the rate of that sine wave based on the time here. The time is going to really randomize it and the flickering rate, the multiplication here is going to determine for that randomization, how fast is it? So this value, I'm going to set to a default value of about 10 and it can go from about 0 to 1000. So I'm going to put in a note there 0 to 1000. Now you're probably wondering why do we have an ad here? We don't need this ad. Well, I found that to give it some more randomization or really some more control. We could do a 1 minus and from the 1 minus we're going to do another scalar parameter and this one is going to be flickering additive amount. And we can hook this up here. And by default, this one's going to be 0.2, but I want this one to vary between 0 and 1 and apply and save this. So we'll go back to our content drawer. We just want to make a child material for this. So we'll right click on it. We will create material instance. And if you look at this, you'll be able to see a slight flickering. Now, if you want to up that, you can change the default value here, but we're actually going to do that in our child material. So we'll go into that. And we've got our two scalar parameters right here. So we can check that off. Flickering additive amount, make this 0.5. And then we see a lot more flickering. If we go back to our torch fire, back to the spotlights, and I search for a material in the details panel, make sure you got spotlight selected here. Then we can search for our firelight, firelight, and I'll choose our instance. And I'll also choose that for spotlight one down here. So firelight, choose our instance. And if they're using the same material, then they're going to flicker at the same rate because they're both using time as a randomizing factor. So we'll compile and save this. And then what we can do so we can actually make this smaller. And you can play with the child material parameters, right? If you up this to something like 0.8, then it's flickering a ton. But I just found that that doesn't look realistic for a fire. You can also increase the rate here. So if we go up to 1,000, that has less of an effect. I found the additive amount really matters. So I'll put this down to 10 again. And if you want a very, very subtle flickering, keep it at 0.2. And then you can see it, but only if you're looking carefully. All right, so the last thing we're going to do for visual effects before we move on to the meta sound is we are going to switch out our spotlights with a new point light component. But what I would like to do for the first time in this series, I'd like to create a new component blueprint. We've created a ton of actor blueprints in this series, but we never created a component blueprint. And the benefit to using that is then we can use that component in any actor. And the reason I think this is useful is because then we can assign like our material, our lighting intensity, our lighting color, and anytime we assign that component to any fire actor in our game, then it'll use all of those settings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to our content drawer over to content. We got a folder here for blueprints. And within the blueprints folder, I'm just going to right click, create a new folder, call it components. And within components, going to create another new folder, and I'm going to call it light components. Go into that. 
and right click, we're going to create a new blueprint class. And you see where we have actor and pawn and character here, then we can also search for a component like point light. So we have a point light actor class here, we don't want that to be the parent class, because instead, we're going to use point light component as the parent class. And that way, this is going to be able to be put in any blueprint. So point light component select, and we'll call it a fire light component. And we'll go into that. And I'm just going to maximize this window. By default, it has all the same settings as a typical point light, but I can change those settings by default. So intensity is going to be set down to 1000. Our light color, I can use our color picker here and pick that color. And just like we did earlier, our source radius is going to be 10 and our soft source radius is going to be 50. And last but not least, I'll search for material up here and we'll give it our firelight material. So if I search for firelight, pick our instance, compile and save this. So if you've got all those settings, if you got your light function material in there, then we are ready to assign this to our torch fire actor. So back to our torch fire actor, I'm going to cut out our spotlights. And instead, we are going to add our firelight component. So if I search for firelight component, boom, right there. And in the viewport, just make sure it's in the right location. So we got to put it directly over our fire. So right about there. And the nice thing about this is when we assign it to other fire actors, we can change the intensity, we can change the attenuation radius, source radius, all that stuff. So we'll compile and save this. And then let's take a look. So we've got some flickering there. And to be honest, I know the spotlight is more realistic, but I just like the look and feel of the point light. I don't know, it's just got a warm earthy glow to it. So the last thing with our torch here, it's not the last thing for this episode, but the last thing for the torch at least. It wouldn't be realistic unless we gave it a sound. And let's do that. Let's go back into our blueprint and let's add an audio component. Audio. And you could put this as a child of the firelight because they're gonna be in the same place. I'm just gonna rename it to be fire audio. And initially when I was thinking of the audio of this, I was like, oh man, we gotta go back to Zap Splat. We gotta look for more free sounds. But then I realized we have some pretty good fire that's already in starter content. So on the right hand side here under sound, if I just search for fire, we get this fire 01 and fire 01 cue. So I'll select that. And let's go into that folder because I want you to hear that. So it's a pretty good fire sound, but it sounds like the fire is a lot larger. Like it's got this air rushing into it sound, this kind of deep <laughs> sound, and you only get that on a larger fire than something like this. So then I was kind of disappointed because then we can't use the sound, right? But then I saw this low pass filter frequency and I was like, what if we could cut out the deep sounds? So I checked this off and then I set it to something like 5,000 and compile and save this. And let me show you what this does because this actually has the opposite effect. It's gonna cut out the high pitch sound. Uh, but it gave me an idea. So now we hear it and it's mostly just that and the crackling, the high pitch stuff is kind of gone. So then I went back in the blueprint here and I searched for a high pass filter because maybe we could filter it in the opposite direction and nothing. And then it came to me. Why not do this in Metasounds? And sure enough, Metasounds has a high pass frequency filter. So let's create the sound in Metasounds. So if we go over to Content Drawer, over to Content, I'm going to go into Sounds, into Ambiance, and right click, we're going to create a new folder for Fire. And we'll go into that, and then we'll right click, and then under Sounds, we'll select Metasound Source. And I will name this Torch Fire 1. We'll go into that. Now the first thing is this sound is just going to loop. It's going to go and go and go. So it's never going to finish, meaning we don't need output on finished. And the warning here is on finish should be connected for one shot meta sound sources. For sources with an undefined duration, i.e. looping, remove the one shot interface and use an audio component. So all we're going to do is over on interfaces, we're going to remove the one shot interface. So we'll hit the trash can here. And then all we got is our output and that's totally fine. So we'll right click here. We'll search for a wave player, wave player mono. We'll hook this up to play. And we'll just search under wave asset, we'll search for our fire, fire 01. I'll set it to loop. And instead of just hooking up our out mono here, so here's the magic. So we got to drag out from out mono and search for a high pass filter, one pole high pass filter, and then connect that up to the out mono. And I played with the cutoff frequency here. It's like, what frequency of the sound do we want to set such that those really low pitch sounds, they don't play. And what I landed on, the magic number was about 6,000. So 6,000. And then if I play this, it's just that light crinkly sound and that's it. And you could play with changing this, right? So if I set it down all the way to something like 1000, then I get more of that airy sound. So we're gonna keep this somewhere between five and 6,000. I'm gonna set it to 5,000 because the other thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna do a very subtle pitch shift in the sound. But instead of doing that here in the meta sound, I'm just gonna do it right in the torch fire blueprint. So over here, search for our fire, come down to the bottom, torch fire, and we'll just do a pitch multiplier, multiply it 1.8, 1.3 something like that save that 
and that's just gonna raise the pitch up a little bit, make it sound like a smaller fire. The other thing I'm gonna do here is this checkbox for play multiple instances. And the reason for that is so that if multiple torches are in the same vicinity, that we're gonna be able to hear all of them. And last but not least, I gotta give this an attenuation setting. And what I found to work well is our footstep soft surface attenuation that we set up all the way back in episode 19. Location, I'm gonna set this back to zero. And let me just show you that attenuation. It's very simple. So enable volume attenuation, inner radius 50, fall off distance 450. Compile and save our blueprint. And we are ready to test this. It's just a light crinkling and none of that really heavy air sound. So in short, what that means is we can filter out the background noise of any sound with like a low pitch background or a high pitch background. And this is awesome. I never knew you could do that for sounds and meta sounds. One more reason to use meta sounds. So for the last part of this episode, we are gonna get this point light, this firelight component up and running on our gameplay ability torch. And this is the very first gameplay ability that we set up all the way back in episode 23. And although it was a cool looking Niagara effect, it didn't actually emit light in the local vicinity. So let's rectify that. So I'm gonna to navigate to the content drawer, back to content, back to gameplay abilities, and then over to blueprints under gameplay abilities. And we'll specifically set this up on gameplay ability fire. So on our gameplay ability fire, we are going to add our fire light component right there. And I'll call it our fire point light. So compile and save this. And then what we need to do is we need to change the transform because what's gonna happen is it's gonna attach itself to the hand, but for whatever reason, I couldn't get it to snap to our actual hand. So it attaches to the hand, but we still need to change the transform such that it is on the hand. And so for that, I'm gonna give it a location of 40, 30, 85. And I just figured that out based on trial and error with this light. And so then we can navigate over to our event graph here. And I'm gonna zoom out a little bit because we have to come down to our activate fire ability and specifically display only, we gotta use this string right here. So this is our torch light. So at the very end of this string, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a reference to our fire point light and I'm gonna set the intensity of this set intensity and it's going to be based on our gameplay ability intensity so i can get intensity and then drag out a pin here multiply this by let's do 10. so if our intensity is 100 then it's going to be a power of 1000 and then connect this up here and then i'm just going to copy both of these and at the end of deactivate ability so down here deactivate ability display only at the end of this string paste them in and we'll keep our new intensity zero because whenever we deactivate yeah intensity should be zero so let's compile and save this, and then we can test it out. And the easiest way to test it out, I'm gonna take one of our gameplay abilities here that we've already created the last couple of episodes, and we'll just copy, paste, and we'll do a new one over here. And we'll just change some details of it. Over to Details Panel, Niagara System will be our Torchlight, our Torchlight Pickup. And by the way, if you're not following this series, then you're gonna look at all this and be like, what, where's this? It's all from previous episodes in the series. So our ability icon is gonna to be Torch, Torchlight. Ability Primary Niagara System, again, search for Torch. It's gonna to be the Torchlight NS. And instead of how gameplay ability is used being channel, you can't see that, but let's select our display only. And then if I right click, play from here, and we can pick it up. But the problem is our light is on by default and it's not attached to our player. It's just sitting there in space. We can be running around our invisible light here. So let's actually attach the actor to our player when we pick it up. So for that, I'm gonna to go to the gameplay ability parent blueprint. So gameplay ability here. And because our gameplay ability fire, when we do a begin play, it's getting everything from our parent here then we can go to our gameplay ability parent and on our event begin play, what we can do is we can attach this actor to a particular component. So I'm gonna move this out that we set up last episode and I'm also gonna zoom out so I can move all of this up a little bit. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a reference to our third person character, get, and that's happening right here. And then we can specifically get the mesh. And from here, we can do an attach actor to component. And then we can hook that up right here. Socket name is gonna be hand underscore r socket. Location rule is gonna be snap to target. Rotation rule, keep relative. All these keep relative is fine. And then we can connect this up here. So then we can compile and save, and that's gonna attach our gameplay ability pickups to our actual character. But then over on the gameplay ability fire, the one other thing we have to do on event begin play, we have to just say, okay, this fire point light, set the intensity to something well, zero, just so that's not activated the moment we pick it up. Last thing here, we need to get a reference to our fire point light, and then from there, attach component to component because we need to attach the fire point light specifically to our player's hand. So I'm gonna get a third person character reference, scroll all the way down, get third person character reference. Specifically, we need to get the mesh. And from the mesh, we'll hook that up to the parent, and the socket is going to be hand underscore R socket. 
and location rule, we have to snap to target. Compile and save this, and then maybe, possibly, we're ready for the final test. All right, moment of truth. Ta-da, we've got our torchlight, and it is actually shining on the ground, and we see the shadows when the player moves. Actually, let me full screen that. Let's see how it interacts with our torch over here. Yeah, so we got a light on light there. That's pretty cool. And if we get really close to the wall, yeah, we can actually see our hand making shadows there, which I actually kind of dig. We can still blow dry our hair from episode 23. So one very last thing to finish up our torch actor here is if we go to edit torch, I just want to set the torch stick itself to have collision. So we search for collision. Collision presets are set to block all dynamic. That's looking good, but we should also go into the static mesh and we should just add a simple collision to this. So collision, I always add a 26 DOP simplified collision. That's looking good. Save this. And then we can exit out of all of these because what we can do is we can literally duplicate our torch fire here, copy and paste. I'm just gonna put it on the ground, see if our player character can run into it. Rotate it slightly upward. Maybe make the scale a little bit taller, 1.5. Last test. Yeah, so our character can't run into the torch fire. Does that look AAA quality? I don't know, guys. We're still just flying by the seat of our pants here, but hopefully you're enjoying the series. So that concludes our episode for today. And I know I've been saying it's been many episodes back now, but we're getting to a gameplay prototype. And we've been kind of distracted the last five or six episodes on our indoor environment here. And I just got one more episode I want to do on indoor environment, and then we're going to go right back to AI and gameplay. And you might have heard those water drops in the background, and if you look very closely, the sounds are coinciding with the water drop there getting the reverb effect of our cave, and we're going to set up all of our gameplay sounds to work properly in indoor environments, starting with this cave. So I hope to see you there.